All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our next episode of Mythic Bird Monday. Uh, it's great to be back again. Uh, today's episode is going to be about one of my favorite mythic birds, uh, the Northern Thunderbird. Uh, and the, one of the reasons why this is my favorite will be revealed shortly. So uh, the Northern Thunderbird is uh, a particularly cool bird uh, because it, it's, it's part of this group of, of mythic creatures that falls under uh, one of these majorly recurring archetypes um, across mythology worldwide. So in general, as I, was, as I was doing research for this book and when I was taking mythology classes in school, it became apparent that uh, there are are a couple of recurring themes, uh, and one of these is, is this uh, concept of thunder, lightning, as one archetype, and then and, and another, which you, this is often recognized uh, in forms such as the phoenix, is this archetype of fire. So if you think about it from a from a perspective of you know anthropology, you know hundreds of years ago, early cultures, uh, you know fire and thunder and lightning would be elemental. Uh, na natural elemental processes that would be terrifying. You know, you'd have your crops and and uh, you know your your homes, however they were built, and these un unexpected, uncontrollable forces of fire and lightning and thunder could just easily wipe out everything um, in a heartbeat. So you know, they they tried to explain these forces using you know what they had, which at the time was supernatural uh, explanations, stories. You know, I think. We all, one of the ones we, everyone knows most easily is Zeus as the bearer of, you know, his thunderbolts. So, you know, trying to explain why lightning would come and, and smite you or smite your crops, you know, it, it was explained through Zeus's anger, just displeasing the gods. And, and so a lot of uh, mythological creatures also carry uh, some of these similar uh, connotations. Uh, the thunderbird in particular is interesting uh, insofar as it's portrayed as both a benevolent creature in, in some stories, but also obviously it can be destructive. Uh, the Thunderbird uh, has the ability to uh, bring lightning and thunder with the crash of its wings. So it has quite a bit of power. Um, and because of that, it was a force to be uh, both respected and feared. Uh, in, some, in some native traditions, uh, you know, the sound of the thunder, of the thunder from its wings is a, a sign of war. So in some instances, you know, it's even a symbol for, for war and that kind of destructiveness. Um, but the, one of the reasons the Thunderbird is so particularly interesting to me is because as I was researching it for, for Once Upon a Feather, uh, I, I realized very quickly that the Thunderbird uh, exists sort of in two spheres. Uh, there's the sphere of popular culture. Uh, you know, a Thunderbird, like the Phoenix, is a bird that more people uh, in general, who, who maybe aren't as uh, interested in birding or mythology, might have been exposed to. And I, I've got some great, you know, i got my really high-tech pictures here again to you know, give some examples. Um, you know, from everything to, uh, you know, this Ford Thunderbird, you know, named for that powerful, strong connotations. Um, uh, you know, the U.S. Air Force actually has this, a fleet of planes they call Thunderbirds uh, because of their, uh, you know, again, with those connotations of strength, speed, and, you know, they're also, they're quite a force to be seen coming out of the sky. Um, I recently discovered that sort of how we have Mozilla Firefox, we also have Thunderbird email now. Uh, I was first introduced to Thunderbirds uh, when I was when I was a kid playing trading card games. There are these old Yu-Gi-Oh cards uh, named for Thunderbirds. So you know, there's all these great depictions of Thunderbirds. And one of the things that was very well, that was fun while creating my own Thunderbird, and I'll sort of explain how I, I built my particular uh, rendition of the Thunderbird later. It was it's interesting to see just how many different kinds. Of depictions exist out there on the internet and in pop culture of this of this common archetype. So here, you know, we've got this yellow bird. Uh, looks extremely different, even in the same company, from this thunderbird. Um, obviously, the recurring archetype, the recurring image in some way is usually some kind of uh, striking force or some kind of denomination of, of a lightning pattern to denote that thunder force. Uh, you know, Magic the Gathering. It's got some thunderbirds. Again, very different, but we still see that, that sense of sky, storm. Um, Harry Potter fans will remember the uh, Thunderbird in Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. Yet another, another depiction. Uh, I, I like, it's interesting how this one's actually a more of a thundery yellow color as opposed to a lot of the, the blues that occur in other depictions like this one and my own. Um, you know, I, even, you know, there's got Final Fantasy Thunderbirds. 
here. And then uh, even uh, Dungeons and Dragons, I found this whole sheet of information about these Thunderbird spells and game scenarios. And this, I love this particular depiction of a Thunderbird here. Um, I didn't actually see this before I did my own, but um, yeah, it was pretty cool. So yeah, lots of lots of pop culture, pop culture inferences. So chances are this is not a, a, a bird that's coming out of the blue like the Yaffingale woodpecker from from a couple weeks ago. Uh, but then aside from this pop culture sphere, uh, the, the Thunderbird in general exists uh, in a sphere uh, where, like I said earlier, it's kind of like a cryptid creature. So in this, in this sphere uh, that inspires pop culture, uh, the Thunderbird uh, it, it exists, and I'll go into those a bit later because they're really, they're really great. Especially from an ornithologist perspective where, you know, you're just like, huh, I wonder what these theories would be like if people considered, you know, turkey vultures. Um, but then aside from this cryptid pop culture sphere, uh, there is this sphere of stories and folklore about Thunderbirds that uh, arises from uh, the, the cultural traditions of, of First Nations in, in North America. And while Thunderbirds exist worldwide, like the Yaffa Yell Woodpecker uh, from Europe, that's a, an example of a Thunderbird. There is a lightning bird from Africa, the Impundulu, which I'll talk about in another episode. Uh, worldwide, there are thunderbird birds. For, for the scope of this, uh, for the scope of this particular thunderbird, I decided to uh, base the inspiration for, for my thunderbird off of stories from um, from First Nations traditions in the United States, sorry, in, in North America, and also, uh, you know, from from my my experiences with it in, in pop culture as well. I try to create a blend. Uh, because I think it was, it's really exciting to see all these, uh, you know, these amazing uh, First Nation stories, but I also wanted to be very careful that when I finally did it, I, I didn't want to appropriate any of those stories as my own. So I, I made sure to also uh, be inspired by pop culture as well and try to blend it all together in a respectful, exciting way. So my Thunderbird um, I created using, you know, Thunder colors. Um, here's a picture from Once Upon a Feather. I based the uh, design of the, of the of the Northern Thunderbird, and I decided to name it the Northern Thunderbird, um, based on sort of the naming we give to other species in, nor in North America, like the Northern Cardinal, uh, just to differentiate it from uh, Thunderbirds from other other parts of the world. I didn't want to be too specific, um, like Pacific Northwest Thunderbird, because there are so many Thunderbirds across across the continent that, uh, as I'll talk about a little bit later, that I just wanted it to denote that I was talking about this specific sphere. Uh, in this part of the globe. So I based my particular Thunderbird off the California condor, uh, which was partially uh, because of uh, the, the connections from a cryptid perspective, uh, and also partially because of my own cool California condor uh, experience. So anyway, onto the, onto the cryptid side of some of these things. So, oh yes, oh, let me just finish this. Oh, so much to talk about, I love this bird. So uh, I designed my Thunderbird so that it would have um, obvious denotations of, of lightning across the body. I wanted to stick with that uh, symbol. You know, it's Thunderbird. You gotta, you gotta take advantage of how cool that is. Um, and like I said, base it, base it off a of California condor, uh, mostly. There are some depictions I've found um, that off that can, uh, where, the, where the Thunderbird is uh, more of like an eagle. This is just one example I found from a, another trading card game, but as I was doing my research, uh, there were instances, particularly in, in native mythologies, where you know there were drawings of thunderbirds, and many of them, interestingly, had very similar, very similar shapes in their drawings, and they resembled very strongly eagles as opposed to more vulture shapes. So I think the two, the two templates, uh, tend to be, at least from from a native perspective, either uh, a vulture or an eagle, definitely some kind of, of giant raptor. Um, and then of course my California condor. California condors are the best vultures, so I had to base it off of that. So getting into the cryptid parts of this particular bird. So thun every thunderbirds are just so cool. And I think there's there's a lot of people out there who, who look for these uh, mythic creatures, like there are Bigfoot hunters, there are Loch Ness hunters. And similarly, there are people who want to prove that the thunderbird exists. So while looking into that aspect of it, I found out some really wild stories. Uh, so it's possible that even uh, native stories were influenced by, you know, the fossils of prehistoric birds. Not birds. Well, I guess, you know, dinosaurs are birds. So in that sense, I'm not wrong in that. 
but they were in, they were influenced by discoveries of giant fossils of pterosaurs, dinosaurs, and then another group of birds uh, called the pterotorans, which were sort of ice age, um, huge, huge birds, you know, 14 to 18 foot wingspans, just enormous. You know, there's, you know, depictions of these birds that existed with the, the megafauna of the ice age, saber tooth tigers, mastodons, and they were well equipped for that era because, you know, the, the food that they had to scavenge was big enough to support a giant bird like that. You know, nowadays, you know, if you think about why some of these giant birds from the Ice Age went extinct, um, you know, there's, there's nothing really big enough for them to scavenge besides, besides whales. So, uh, yes, so just to give you another idea, there is a particular pterotorn called Argentavis, one of the, supposedly the biggest bird uh, ever found, you know, known to science in terms of its wingspan. And that bird would have been, had a 24 foot wingspan and would have dwarfed the Andean condor which is uh, this bird here. So a lot of people in the cryptid world, and even just from a scientific perspective, think that the uh, Thunderbird might have been inspired by uh, a bird such as a Territorn, Argentavis, um, which would explain how it took on more of a raptor appearance in its depictions. Um, but it's interesting because, uh, you know, this looks really nothing like a raptor. So how people got from point A to point B is, uh, could be largely a matter of the imagination. So there are two uh, hysterical, the interesting, and I say hysterical just because it's so wild to believe that, uh, that people, you know, were thinking about finding these real birds. And, and I, ha I have some great photos here of some cryptid hunters who actually went out and uh, found these photos of instances where people believe that they had found what was a real living Thunderbird. Uh, so in 18, 1864, uh, this picture was taken during the Civil War. So I, I do think it's funny that during the Civil War, uh, there was still time to pose with this, what looks like a, a carcass of a pterodon uh, they believe was a Thunderbird. So this, you know, considering it's from 1864, supposedly, this would be a really well, this would be very hard to Photoshop back in 1864. Uh, so, you know, it, it, does, it does look pretty great. However, this picture is for very obvious reasons, likely believed to be a hoax, uh, because, yeah, that'd be great. Um, but uh, interestingly enough, uh, in Arizona, there was a report of a, a bird being shot that looked very similar to the one in this photo. And then uh, in June of 1977, there was this uh, instance where a small, a young boy, Marlo, I think it's like in my notes here, Marlon Lowe was actually carried off by re what reports say was a giant bird that was able to pick up and carry this 56 pound boy up to two feet in the air for quite a distance before his mother came out through some rocks and, and got and got the bird to drop the boy. So uh, reporters and people who uh, you know ex investigated the story back in 1977 uh, drew these photos, drew these uh, images here uh, based on their story and then you know, to me, this looks exactly like our Andean condor friend here. However, uh, you know, that bird being in North America would be a very, very lost bird or an escapee from a zoo, perhaps. Uh, you know, a more logical explanation would be that, you know, a California condor, though it's not wasn't really its range at the time, might have somehow flown in that direction. And then, of course, there are always uh, turkey vultures. I really can't fathom how that would work biologically, a turkey vulture picking up a 56-pound boy. But a lot of reports uh, that I read about of, of potential Thunderbirds uh, did, in the end, seem to be talking about what were very likely turkey vultures. So in this instance, I, I still don't know what kind of bird might have picked up a 56-pound boy and, and dragged him that far. Uh, but that's, that's how the story goes, and that's how it was reported. Uh, so that is uh, enough for some people to believe that there really is a Thunderbird out there. And, and people are still looking. And who knows? Maybe there is something. I like to believe. I believe in the ivory-billed woodpecker. Okay, so last but not least, uh, besides this, you know, it's, it's a Bigfoot kind of role and it's pop culture kind of role, um, the one that was most interesting to me as I was researching, uh, researching this bird for Once Upon a Feather is the uh, role of this bird in native mythology. And fascinatingly, this bird shows up 
uh, not just in Alaska, Pacific Coast, which is where uh, a lot of the stories do, I, I, where I uh, experience most of the stories, uh, but it's also been, a, it's also appeared in mythologies all the way across the country to the East Coast. Uh, the Algonquins have stories of a Thunderbird, uh, the Menominee tribes of the Midwest, the Ojibwe, they also have different stories of the Thunderbird. Um, so it's fascinating, it's always fascinating to me to see how there's this diffusion of, of these ideas uh, across, a, across a huge area. And even if they didn't necessarily have contact with each other at first, I know a lot of, I know a lot of tribes obviously did have contact with each other, uh, but even just the fact that worldwide there's these constant recurring, um, you know, Thunderbirds used as these, as these ways of explaining thunder. I think it's just a really cool connection between all of us that, that somehow in our, in our trying to understand how these these natural phenomena happen? We we decided as a as a human species to to pin that power on birds. I mean, how cool is that? So, you know, one of the some of the I'm not going to get into every single uh, native story because there are so so many and they they do vary from from first nation to first nations. But I do want to uh, point out a couple of things that you know some of the similarities I found, which were interesting. In general, uh, that the world the Thunderbird was a benevolent bird. You know, obviously it had the ability to be destructive with its, you know, ability to generate thunder and lightning, uh, but that was often done either as a, in a role of a protector or just in a, in a role of, of, you know, sort of making sure morality was enforced. Um, there, there tended to be the, the thunderbird, you know, which would make sense uh, as, a, as a raptor figure, tends to have the domain, its domain above the clouds, you know, high up in the overworld, uh, and then... Uh, a lot of times in many stories, it is in some shape or form in conflict with creatures of either underwater or, or the underworld. And, uh, you know, some of these creatures often are snakes. Sometimes it's a, a whale, uh, but the condor uh, fights to protect humans from, from these creatures and just sort of, again, maintain morality and order uh, in that respect. Um, I had the... Uh, the wonderful experience to live in a, a native village in, in Huna, Alaska for a year and a half. And during that time, uh, I did actually get to see some of the, the Haida and, and Klingit uh, depictions of the, of the Thunderbird and some of their beautiful, um, beautiful beadwork and weaving depicting uh, the Thunderbird. And a, a lot of that work is in this form line style here, uh, which was just absolutely beautiful. Uh, the Thunderbird is an important figure in those areas. Uh, specifically, there's a, a Thunderbird tribe clan um, in BC, Columbia. Or, actually, it might be Victoria. I'm sorry, Victoria. There's actually a Thunderbird park, and there's a. It's filled with the filled with these beautiful uh, totems honoring the Thunderbird. The Thunderbird is on top here, uh, sort of symbolically showing its role in the heavens. Um, and then uh, one of my favorite stories was the story of how a thunderbird actually carried off a whale so that so that the humans could could return to fishing. And I, I have this picture of a, of a piece of artwork by a, a native man named Carver Everson from the Comox and uh, Quagul First Nations. I just love that one there. Here's another picture of uh, a thunderbird depicted on more midwestern. Uh, native art. So it's just fascinating to see how the bird, you know, across cultures, across uh, the geography, just still has so many similar aspects. All right, so I think that uh, wraps it up for today. Oh, no, it doesn't. I have one more little thing. This is a, this is a long list again, like it's one of my favorites. Um, right, so uh, I turned this, uh, I turned my Thunderbird into a condor because I had the coolest condor experience ever. I, I wanted to see the California condor back when I was 24 and, and backpacking around uh, San Francisco. So I, I walked down Pacific Highway 1, uh, rather, how should we put this, in a very carefree manner, considering I was walking down a highway with all these twists and turns and cars uh, rattling by at very, very fast speeds. But I wanted to see that bird. And, and sure enough, I walked around a corner, and there were two California condors uh, sitting in a tree on the edge of... Uh, the cliffs before they dropped off into the Pacific Ocean and you know I was just out of my mind and you know I'd done a lot of reading about the California condor before going uh, so I'd known about its connections to you know a lot of mythologies it's a lot of times how there, that there was this bird this thunderbird that existed and in the instant I saw this third condor this juvenile bird 
Uh, it flew up right over my head. I mean, I could have thrown something at it and hit it. It was so close. And, you know, it's in that instant, that was, that was my mythic bird experience because I could hear that amazing thunder in its wings. And I, I really understood how, how people could believe that there would be a thunderbird. And for me, that thunderbird had to be this condor because there was nothing else quite, quite as epic as that. And, you know, it, it was huge when it flew up. It, you know, flew in front of the sun around midday. It really did block out the sun. I mean, it was, it was, it was quite an experience. So, uh, in, in that respect, uh, I decided to, you know, especially after based on so many images of the Thunderbird as a, as a raptor and, and, you know, this huge bird, all that cryptid, uh, all those cryptid investigations linking the bird back to some kind of thing that could be a condor, could be some kind of huge raptor. I decided to, uh, that it would be okay to incorporate my own personal experience into the into the design of this mythic bird, since it was in line with with it, with imagery, with with uh, with stories, with and so yeah. So the Thunderbird is a uh, a magical California condor with lightning powers. So I hope you enjoyed this episode of Mythic Bird Monday. Uh, it's it's getting more, it's getting easier. Uh, I'm getting I feel like I'm getting a little better at this. Get better and better. Um, I will see if there are any questions in the comments. And if anybody has um, any more interest in mythic birds, I do have uh, my book Once Upon a Feather on my website, which I dropped a link to in the description. And then also to make this more fun and to encourage everyone to uh, bring some mythic birds into their life, I am also I also created a section on my website where I'm posting uh, some coloring pages for the kids or the young at heart uh, to enjoy, you know, creating your own mythic bird or coloring it however you want or you know. Uh, and then I'm also uh, putting some uh, some bookmarks there for download as well as links back to all these episodes. So that is all found in the description here. So I hope you enjoy that extra fun. And I will see you uh, next week for our fourth episode, which is going to be a fun one. All right. All right. So have a wonderful night and see you all next week.